Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all here. We're going to continue our series today on the greatest story ever told, and we're going to a part of the Bible in Genesis. Now, would you believe this promise made in 2012? What you'll get under us are tax cuts without new taxes and also no cuts to education, uh, no cuts to health. Would you believe that promise? What about this promise made in 2010? There will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. Would you believe that promise? <laughs> There's a few people looking quizzical. Or how about this one? Perhaps this one, the most defining of promises. Read my lips. No new taxes. Now, each of these promises were all made by politicians seeking to gain election. Now, can anyone remember, actually, who made these promises? So who made this one? Does anyone remember? Who made this promise? Under us, we'll get no tax cuts without new taxes, no cuts to education and health. Anyone remember who that was in 2012? I, I, I'll forgive you, Gustavo. You weren't in the country here when, <laughs> when this was made, so that's okay. Um, anyone? Anyone want to have a guess? Tony Abbott made that promise in 2012. Okay, this one might be a bit easier. Who made this one? There will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. It was made by? It wasn't ScoMo. It was, no, not Kevin Rudd. It was, no, it was Julia Gillard made that promise, which of course didn't happen. Um, but then, of course, okay, you probably should be able to get this one. This is the most uh, defining problem. Who said this one? Promise in 1988. Read my lips, no new taxes was made by? It was George Bush Sr., the 43rd President of the United States. Now, how many of those promises were kept? <laughs> no, not many is an understatement. None of them. None. Now, this isn't a criticism of any individual politician, but it's reflective of the challenges of the modern political leadership. It's just hard to keep promises. So much so that American financier Burden Baruch once said, vote for the man who promises least He'll be the least disappointing. <laughs> but promising little is hardly inspiring, is it? But maybe promising little is better than a broken promise. For promises are based on trust. If you break a promise, trust is eroded. Politically, this can be disastrous. And George Bush's broken promise was catastrophic. It's been described as the six most destructive words in the history of presidential politics. But in any relationship, marriage or friendship or family, broken promises diminish trust, intimacy and connection. Regardless of whether promises are core or non-core, it's hard to trust people who make promises and break them. Well, Today, at the beginning of Genesis, we come across some of the most important promises ever made in the history of humanity. These promises are far more important and significant than any tax cut or political promise. For these promises concern the reconciliation of humans with their creator. Last week in the ultimate origin story, God gave humans a special mandate. Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and steward it as his special representatives. But things have gone horribly wrong. Instead of being fruit, instead of being of being fruitful, sorry, instead of fruitfulness, harmony, and peace, there's discord, violence, and murder. Rather than intimacy, community, and connection, there's pride, lust, polygamy, and relational breakdown. Humans are estranged from God, and the way to Him is barred by sin and a flaming sword. And so God has a choice. He can abandon his creation. He can walk around from the disaster that the human race is becoming and just leave them to destruction. Or he can bring about reconciliation, a renovation to bring wholeness, forgiveness and connection with himself, to be their God and have a people for himself. And the good news is that God has chosen the latter, reconciliation, and to do this, God has made some big promises to a man called Abram. These promises begin his plan to achieve reconciliation and harmony. And today we explore these promises and we learn that God, unlike any politician, can be trusted. 
From the grand cosmic meta themes found in chapters 1 to 11, the story of Genesis then moves at the end of chapter 11 to focus on one man, Terah, and his son Abram, who was married to the childless Sarai living in the land of Haram. Now, from this one relatively obscure, unremarkable person who appears just as another name from among the many in the genealogies of Genesis chapter 10 and 11, the whole trajectory and story of the Bible changes. The story of rebellion, violence and spiralling despair changes with a series of promises God makes to Abram. These promises show that Abram is to play a central role in restoring humanity's broken relationship with God. So in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, as Esther just read to us, The Lord said to Abram, Go for your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So here... Some huge promises are made to Abram, far bigger than any tax cut or election promise. In verse 2, Abram is promised to be the recipient of blessing. He will be blessed and made into a great nation. He's also promised to become famous. His name will become great. Now these are the kind of promises that any aspiring YouTuber, influencer or TikToker would love, aren't they? But Abram is also promised to be a mediator. Of blessing, he will be. He will go and be a blessing, and connection with him will ensure blessing and connection for all peoples on earth. But the converse also applies that anyone who curses Abram will also be cursed. So hence, Abram acts as a mediator of blessing to the world. So, in contrast to the spiraling destruction of the biblical story to this point, here we have the first glimpse. Of hope, a new stage of God's dealings with humanity. God has not abandoned his world to destruction. He has a plan through these promises made to Abram. Now the commentary on this verse in the Net Bible, which is a fantastic resource to help study the Bible, says uh, it'll be hard to overestimate the value of this call and this divine plan for the theology of the Bible. Here begins God's plan to bring redemption to the world. So how does Abram respond to this? Does Abram think, oh, sure, okay, I'm hearing voices in my head again. This is starting to sound a bit weird. Or does he think, well, actually, you know, I'm pretty happy here at my home. It's a bit of a pain to move house, well, maybe move tent, perhaps, in those days. Uh, This is my family's home. Why would I want to move where the, the language is different and people eat funny food? Well, we see Abram's response. In verse 4, so Abram went, as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. So Abram obeys. He hears God and he sets out with his wife and family and moves from Haran to Canaan. Hopefully that makes sense. You can see where Haran is up in sort of southern Turkey at the moment and you go down towards where he moves to Shechem. So Abram travelled from the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah, at Shechem. So Abraham arrives in the land that the Lord has promised, the land of Canaan. And then he arrives at this new land and the Lord makes another big promise. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. Big promises, not only greatness, blessing and fame, but the Lord has promised the land of Canaan to his offspring. Now this all sounds wonderful, but these promises actually create two tensions in the narrative. Abram's promise to become a great nation and his offspring or his seed will be given land. But we we recall Genesis 11.30, there's a seemingly incidental detail which now becomes pregnant with meaning, pun intended, because Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Abram's wife, Sarah, had not been able to conceive. She had not been blessed according to the creation mandate. So how can Abram become great, be a blessing and have his name become great when he's now older and his older wife is childless? So this is the first tension. And the second tension concerns the land. How can God promise land that already belongs to someone else? Verse 6, at that time the Canaanites were in the land. 
is this reminiscent of stolen land? You know, God promising to take away the land from an already existing indigenous culture? Well, this is a delicate and a tricky question that's perhaps worthy of a longer reflection. But part of the motivation to promise the land in which the Canaanites live actually goes back to earlier events in the biblical narrative and the curses that Noah places on Ham in Genesis 9, 24 to 27. Thus, the enmity between the house of Shem, which is Abraham, is a part, and then the house of Ham, which is Canaan, is descended, remains an important background story in describing the enmity between Abraham's offspring and Canaan and hence providing some justification for the promise of the land where the Canaanites currently live. But moreover, from Genesis 10, it appears the Canaanites themselves were not actually indigenous to this particular land, but they were themselves were invaders and settlers. Hence, God had never actually gifted them the land. So in, in time, the biblical authors, authors will indicate that the inhabitants of Canaan are actually unworthy occupants of the land, making more sense of why Abraham is promised this particular land. Now, more of this tension will come as the biblical story unfolds, but the promise of this land, the promised land, is a promise which dominates the biblical narrative for the next several hundred years. But one thing can be certain, that this promise to Abraham cannot be used to justify the conquests of lands or any lands in the modern world. Indeed, unfortunately, this very promise of Abraham was used in the 19th century by European settlers to comfort people emigrating to Australia. In 1848, the Presbyterian minister John Dunmore Lang said to travellers departing on a trip from London bound for Australia, he said, Divine providence is for the wisest and most, more beneficent purposes, now saying to many of the very best men of our country, as, our, as to our father Abraham of old, Get ye up out of your country and from your father's house unto a land I will show you, and I will make you there a great nation. Recognize that quote that he's used there? Even though Lang was an esteemed theologian, here he's misunderstood, I think, God's great story and in the Bible, and he's misused this promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. The promise God makes to Abraham is specific to him to make him famous, to create a specific nation, to bring about a specific seed, to bring blessing to the whole world. To use this to justify immigration to Australia, no matter how great Australia may well be, is a gross misuse of the Bible. Now, there are many people in, in our church here who have moved from a distant land, from China, from Vietnam, from Asia or Europe, to seek a new life here in Australia. And yes, moving to another country can be a difficult experience. It's dislocating and difficult. They speak a funny language and eat funny foods. And amidst the dislocation and difficulty, trusting in the Lord can provide peace, protection and blessing. But there is no promise in the Bible to modern people that they should leave their home country and come anywhere and God's going to make them into a great nation. These promises to Abram reveals God's great unfolding story. He has a plan to redeem the world, promising Abram, fame, a nation and land. And these promises are given by grace to Abram, a man who wasn't particularly special. Big, huge promises. I mean, gosh, starting to sound a bit like Donald Trump here, aren't I? You know, these are big, these are huge. These are just a, it's going to be huge, they're going to be great. <laughs> it's just going to be incredible promises, bigger promises than anybody else. That's right, I'm just going to offer you uh, bigger promises than any offered by any politician. And by grace... Abram is to become the one through whom blessing flows and will bring intimacy and connection between God and humanity. And then as the narrative continues, the underlying tension of the Lord's promise comes to the surface when the Lord makes yet more promises to Abram in Genesis 15. So if you've got your Bibles there, you can open up to chapter 15. We're going to have a look at a couple of verses in chapter 15 before we get to 17. Um, after this, this is in 15.1, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. The Lord is promising to protect Abram and reward him in great abundance. But Abram's no fool, no fool. And he starts to appreciate certain challenges that these promises of nationhood, greatness and blessing to his offspring inheriting the land make for him. So after this restatement of the Lord's desire to make Abram great, in verses 2 and 3, 
Abram outlines what is, I think, the fairly large elephant in the room. He says, but, but, he says, Abram said, but sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate will be Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram says, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. So it's a pretty reasonable question. The Lord's made a bunch of huge promises and now Abraham is, or Abram is questioning the implementation. This sounds fine to be a great nation and all, but I'm not sure you realise this, Lord, but I don't actually have any kids. So in response, the Lord makes another huge promise. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And he said to them, so shall your offspring be. Now this seems like a crazy promise. Even politicians limit the extravagance of their promises. But this promise is for an old man to have a son who will be of his own flesh and blood. Also, not only is Abram's wife Sarai childless, but she's getting on a bit. I'm not trying to be ageist here, but at least you know, she's at least 65 years old here. And God's promised this elderly couple children, but not just children, a great nationhood, thousands of descendants, as there are stars in the sky. Remember, there's no light pollution in those days. So if you look up at Northcote tonight, this promise doesn't sound particularly impressive, you know. Okay, you get five or six descendants, maybe an aeroplane. But Abram is promised countless descendants from his own flesh and blood. Now, there are remarkable instances in the modern age of elderly women giving birth. Uh, Eramanti Mangamam from India holds the world record. Now, does anyone know how old she was when she gave birth? The, oldest, the, woman, the oldest woman to have had a baby. Anyone have a guess at how old she was? Sorry, 62? I'll give you a hint it's older. But anyway, does anyone want to anyone have, have a guess? Come on, anyone? Come on the front row over here. You're, you're pretty good at these kind of things, quizzes. Come on. 80. You're going to have a guess of 80. Okay. Anyone have another guess at the back? Anyone have another guess? 70. Okay, Lam, you're the closest. It was actually, she gave birth to twin girls at the age of 74. Yet this modern, miraculous birth was achieved only with the assistance of modern medicine, IVF and egg donation. Technology well beyond anything possible in Abraham's era. And so this promise from God stretches the bounds of credulity. It seems like a promise of impossible offspring. And what's Abram's response to this? This promise of impossible offspring. Verse 6. Abram believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. Abraham trusted in this big, crazy, ridiculous promise. He believed the Lord. He believed sincerely that the Lord would do what he promised. It's astonishing, remarkable faith. And notice the result there, that the Lord credited it to him as righteousness. Now this is a massively significant verse. Abram is viewed as righteous because he believes unreservedly that God will fulfill his seemingly impossible promise. He is righteous not because of anything he's done. It's because of his faith. He trusts in the character and the goodness of God. He trusts in the faithfulness of God. And the Lord declares Abram righteous as a result. He didn't work for it. It was given to him as a gift. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Abram's faith is the model of faith, and it's picked up in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Romans, where the Apostle Paul is considering how people are saved. He asks, how do people enter a right relationship with God? How are they justified before God? Is it through our actions, our good works, our good deeds? Do our good works make God happy with us? Or is it through faith? And Paul calls on the example of Abraham in Romans 4, 2-3 to, to settle the matter. Where he says, if in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Does this sound familiar? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. 
To the Apostle Paul here, the sequence of events is critical because the sequence underlines the biblical doctrine of justification by faith. Because in Genesis 15, Abraham or Abram is reckoned or declared righteous before he's, before he's performed any ritual or good deeds, something that you could potentially boast about. He hasn't even been circumcised yet. Instead, he trusts God's promises. He believes God at the point he, and at that point, he is credited as righteous, rendering circumcision or any ritual or good deeds unnecessary to have a right relationship with God. And the Apostle Paul explains more in Romans 4, 18 to 22. I'll read it out. Hopefully you can read that, but I'll read it out. Uh, which says, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. So shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his face, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave God, glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what had, he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. So Abram is promised impossible offspring, which he trusts. And Abram's faith forms the model, the principle, the pattern, which undergird our relationship with God, that we are declared righteous through faith in God, and his promises, and not by good deeds. And the promises that God makes uh, to Abram are then codified in the second half of Genesis 15, where God makes an unconditional covenant or agreement with Abraham, sorry, Abram to give him the land. And then in Genesis 17, God yet makes yet more promises to Abram and makes another covenant. Genesis 17 says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and I will greatly increase your numbers. So here the Lord then makes another covenant, an agreement with Abram. And here God again reiterates his promise to Abram to be the father of many nations. So much so that Abram's name will actually be changed to Abraham, meaning the father of many. Abraham will be fruitful and multiply which echoes the creation mandate of Genesis 1, to be fruitful and multiply. And then there is the promise of land. The land Canaan is promised again in verse 8. The whole of Canaan, where you are now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Yet embedded in this final eternal promise is a more profound and deeper promise of divine intimacy and connection. The relationship between God and humans that was smashed in Eden, here is a glimmer of hope that relational intimacy between humans and the divine will be fulfilled again in the physical land of Canaan, where the Lord promises, and I will be their God. This promise somewhat like the experience in Eden, is a promise where God will be close and connected with his people. No longer will people be lost, dislocated, estranged, but they will have a place, a land, permanence, and the Lord will be their God, offering connection and intimacy. This promise eclipses any political promise. Indeed, this sets up the grand story, the greatest story ever told, the story of this land, of this nation, which will be an everlasting possession and brings connection with the divine. Our culture has become pretty non-religious. Nearly 40% of Australians tick no religion in the last census. And here in Northcote, it's over 60%. Yet there is still a yearning for the transcendence, for connection with something bigger, with something permanent and something good. This drives, I think, the, the desire for things that we see around us here in, in Northcote, in the inner north, like yoga, you know, retreats, uh, crystals, meditation, new age, wellness, and connection with nature. But this is where the story of the Bible provides good news. For that connection with something bigger is promised here, that the Lord God will create a special people for whom he can have intimacy and connection and community. Yet notice that this covenant in Genesis 6, 17 is conditional. 
that these promises will come to Abraham if he's obedient. Verse 1, walk before me faithfully and blameless and be blameless. And in verse 9, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants, after you for the generations to come. This new agreement requires obedience from Abraham. Faith expresses itself in action. Justification comes by faith alone, but it is a faith that is not alone. And so Abraham, the great man of faith, trusts the Lord and hence commands all of his male descendants to become circumcised. I actually don't have a slide for that one, just in case you're interested. As a sign of this covenant. Then Abraham demonstrates his faith through his willingness to sacrifice his only son Isaac, his seed, leading God to confirm his covenant with Abraham in Genesis 22. Abraham trusts a promise-making God. He trusts God's promises for land and blessing, which will enable humanity to overcome its dislocation from God. But God's blessing on Abraham and his seed, his offspring, depends on their obedience to the Lord. And as the story progresses, we'll see just exactly how faithful this seed of Abraham remains as the story continues. We'll see. So was Abraham naive? Was he conned into believing these big promises of God, just like a politician? Did God say to him, read my lips? Well, as the grand story of the Bible unfolds, it reveals God who, as one who is faithful and who can be trusted, far more than any politician, but also more faithful than any human, friend, spouse, family member, or church leader. The Bible reveals God as faithful and can be trusted. As Hebrews 11, 11, 1, 11 to 12 extols the f- faith of Abraham and Sarah. Oh, sorry, that was um, Isaac being, um, yeah, sorry. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Despite all the medical odds, Sarah conceives and bears a son Isaac, and from him a great nation, a great people is formed. So does this then mean that God is just going to make my life better and promise me, and promise me impossible things? Well, the point of this passage is not that because God gave Abraham a child miraculously that he can give us the miraculous desires of our heart. No, it demonstrates that he has a plan. He's faithful to his promises. And so we, like Abraham, can trust him and entrust our lives to him. We aren't necessarily called to leave our home and establish a new nation, but we are called to trust in this promise-making God. And as we close today, I thought I'd I'd like to ask someone who has found the promises of Abraham a blessing amidst challenging times to share. So I'd now like to ask my wife, Di, to come and please just share briefly um, her personal reflections. I might cry, and that's okay. (laughs) I hope you're okay with that. So um, I would like to share with you um, what the promises of Abraham uh, mean to me and have meant to me. So, sorry. Um, over the past 10 years, um, it feels like there's been a steady stream of disappointments for me. And I won't go into the details, but there have been times where I was very excited about what I thought God was doing and how he was using me, only to end up in situations where I felt injustice had been done or when I felt humiliated or alone. And I know many of you have noticed my recent exhaustion and I'm I'm so grateful for your concern. And one reason for the exhaustion is these constant disappointments. The most painful part of these difficult times was feeling like God had let me down. Um, So it was so important when I was feeling this way to know that he was, that he does keep his promises and is faithful. 
I could know it because his promises to Abraham were fulfilled and are being fulfilled through Jesus, that I could trust him. I could know that I am part of God's people and I, I will live in God's special place and experience God's full blessing in the life to come. So although I felt like he wasn't faithful um, because of my circumstances, I knew he was. And this gave me meaning and purpose and hope. And it, although I know it's God who keeps me in relationship, I could continue trusting him and keep feeling connected to him um, and not totally give up um, and despair. So I hope that is some encouragement. God is faithful to his promises. The author of Lamentations, many hundreds of years later, amidst the horror of the exile, said, Great is your faithfulness. The psalmist wrote, Your faithfulness reaches the skies. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. God is faithful and his promises are fulfilled in Christ. The fulfillment of these promises in Christ is transposed somewhat, but, we, but we'll see how they're fulfilled as the story unfolds. But God's promises, his big promises, are yes in Christ. God remains faithful. Abraham trusted a faithful promise-making God and may we continue trusting in this God despite challenges and difficulties to his glory, knowing that we are his people and that he is our God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace in choosing Abraham to be the one through whom blessing comes to your world. We thank you for his great faith in you and your promises and that it is by faith that we are declared righteous, not through our good works. And we thank you for your faithfulness and fulfilling all your promises in Jesus. May we be encouraged to live for him, trusting in you and your goodness now and always. Amen. Thank you. Please take a seat. Hebrews 11, 8 to 11 says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise, where he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Father, may we go from here reminded of your grace in choosing Abraham, encouraged by the faith of Abraham, and may we live by faith and step into this week confident of your faithfulness as we look forward to our future hope with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for joining us this week. It's great to see you. Please stick around and have a chat. I think there's some games perhaps for some of the kids to play, and maybe some of the adults perhaps to play as well. And next week we're going to continue the greatest story ever told. And next week I think we move into the realm of Ridley Scott and the Exodus, Gods and Kings, the true story. So I look forward to seeing you. That and I can't promise too many CGI special effects, but we'll see what we can do in the, next, in the, in the budget that allows us. But anyway, have a great week and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.